we planted, my wife and I back there, we planted a church a, a few years ago, and we, we worship in a, uh, a 90-year-old American Legion building that has had zero renovations in 90 <laughs> years, um, and it looks the opposite of this. Uh, and so it's kind of strange having, you know, what's pulpit? Um, <laughs> So what an honor, and hearing about Bruce and the book of John, I'm, I'm terrified because I started the book of John six weeks ago, um, uh, and I'm not done with chapter one yet. So let's see, carry the four, ooh, that's going to be a while, but it's such a beautiful book. Uh, and so that just resonates so deep in my soul that the word of God is preached for the glory of God to the people of God. And what a, what a beauty that is. So let me begin by prayer and let's enter into the word of God. Jesus, it is truly an unimaginable honor to be yours, to be loved by you, that, that the word is not only that glorious and beautiful, but the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That the word is a light. It's a lamp to our feet. That the word itself is a double-edged sword that cuts and penetrates even the hardest of our hearts. That the word of God, as we'll have with the Lord's Supper, is also the bread of life. It is the nourishment of that the world needs, but right now it's the nourishment that I need. So Lord, we bank upon your promise that the word of God never comes back void. And so with that being said, this is your time and your words and you would diminish things that are of me and you'll expand and expound things that are of you that you get the glory and your your children get to enjoy and express the gospel. Jesus, in your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. As we get into our text, I want to give you a, a bit of a, uh, of a rubric of where we're going to go. It, something that I've learned a lot lately, and that we have one, we have three kids. Uh, my youngest got married a couple of years ago. She lives in Austin which is where I grew up. Um, our, we're going in the opposite order. Uh, we have three, and so number three already got married. Number two is getting married in May. Happens to be the same week as our 30th anniversary, and I'm officiating, so I'm going to make it all about me because <laughs> it's the way I do things. And the, the oldest is, is not yet because she is an artist in Durango, Colorado, and she is just wonderful. Uh, and so marriage is that theme that uh, I've heard so many theologians and preachers, and Tim Keller has said this so well, that if you look at Scripture, Scripture begins with a marriage, and Scripture ends with a marriage. So therefore, this book has to be about marriage. And so that's what I want to talk about, is what, what is that marriage? What does it look like? Uh, and as we get into it, it's kind of, we're going to talk about enjoying and expressing the gospel. Um, it's going to come up eventually. Oh, thank you. Your guys are amazing back there. Did you know that? Um, I want to read the word of God. I would appreciate, well, who cares what I appreciate? Would you please stand to receive the word of God? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day 
drawing near. This is the word of God. God. So you can be seated. So as we walk through this passage, I want to I want to paint this picture of marriage. That it's so often when I do premarital counseling, which is fun. I enjoy doing premarital counseling because you don't have to worry nearly as much about the enjoyment of marriage. You work really on what what does it look like? What is the expression of marriage look like? Because typically these are people that are kind of the the wide-eyed, a little bit gaga over each other. And so they can't hardly fathom a time that they're not just going to love being with each other all the time. And I laugh and I laugh. (laughs) This particular passage goes into the expression of the marriage between the groom and the bride. But it goes deeper into it saying that there, there is something that creates the expression. Don't, don't skip to the expression. Spend your time. It's what Josiah was talking about earlier, is the gospel is for the believer and the non-believer. The gospel and gospel transformation is for me today. The gospel was for me when I woke up because this morning I woke up and I needed new morning mercies and I got them. So the gospel is not just the beginning. The gospel is the whole picture. And then this passage will then go into after it explains what the gospel is and say this is what it, what, this is what it smells like going forward. This is what it looks like as you push forward in it. And so I'll go into what is the gospel expression Like, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, the the, the word therefore, and so let's understand, because he's actually giving a therefore, and then he's coming underneath saying, here's what it's there for. Uh, And so let's look at, let's look at what we are enjoying and expressing. This is a a new-ish mission statement for, for our church in Brevard. By no means am I saying it should be other people's. It's just what the Lord has given us. And it's simply to enjoy and express the freeing, radical love of Jesus. So our, our goal, that's why we exist as a church, is to enjoy and express the freeing, radical love of Jesus. But to understand what the freeing, radical love of Jesus is, we have to go deep into Scripture and just be bathed with what this love actually is. So let me give you these little steps. Typically, we, especially in more evangelical churches, we so quickly get this order wrong. I so quickly, I so quickly will jump to the wrong order. And so this is something I learned from a guy named Jeff Vanderstelt. He's the one that took Mark Driscoll's job in Seattle. Um, and just a phenomenal guy that's really done an amazing renovation of a church that was in such difficult times. And he, re- he, he came and spoke at our church a f- few years ago. He reminded us that you don't jump to the, to the end of, of what do I do? Because so often we in the church will jump quickly to, to the, well, what do I do? How do I do good things? What, what, what should I do? What should I not do? I'm like, you are getting so far ahead of yourself. The first question is, who is God? And that answer of who God is will determine what God does and what he has done. His nature defines what he does. And what he has done and is doing, that defines who I am. That's important. Put a pin in that one because I have a hard time with it. And then my nature, because of who I am, then that will be an expression, therefore, of what I do. You see, I get it backwards. This is the, when we're in the gospel growth time, we're talking about the repentance. Like, what do you, what is this thing of repentance and encouragement? And it's something that my wife's been helping me work on um, for 52, well, she had to be 52 years, but for a long time, 30 years, is that I so quickly go to the opposite, thinking that my identity and my value is based upon what I do. It's based upon some form of metrics that I've created in my head that if this, if I do this or this, or these metrics in church attendance or church whatever, or 
I have all these metrics of what I do and don't do, and those somehow define whether I am a man of value or not. And the gospel says that is the opposite order. It starts with the unbelievable and unimaginable beauty of who God is. And you start with this God of that is love, and he's just, and he's holy, and he's perfect, and he's glorious, and he is infinitely transcendent, and he is miraculously imminent that he is in, and he is around, and he is perfect, and he is sovereign, that he has created, and he is the grandest artist and maker of beauty ever, and he is the finisher of all these things, and he will come one day, and he will bring his whole bride with him. That's who he is, and therefore... Because he is true to himself, we can know then, what does God do? You see, I've known a lot of answers in my life. I grew up as a church kid, and I liked scripture. I I, I knew theology even relatively young, but, and I worked in a couple of different churches. When I got to my church in Asheville, um, and that's where Josiah was my boss for a while, my mentor. He taught me so much. Um, In that church, they told me something that made me really angry and shocked me. I didn't understand what they meant by it. They said, Brian, you know the words, but you don't know the dance. I could, I could write you a treatise on the right theology. I could pass your exams. Uh, I could say the right things. I could do the right things, but I missed out on the dance of the gospel. The beauty that, that, remember one of my favorite non-biblical theology words uh, is perichoresis. It's uh, it's the way that the ancients used to try to, to describe the Trinity. And perichoresis literally means to dance around. And so the Trinity was the Father, Son, and Spirit uh, that through all time and eternity as, as, as one, they would dance around, that that's the love and beauty they had with each other. And the gospel is him bringing us into a dance with him. And to my old, old German heritage, that just, did, that just didn't feel right. I needed some blacks and whites and some answers and some theology and the do's and the don't do's. And it just, it was hard for me to grasp the tender beauty of the gospel. And so that was a time for gospel transformation for me. And it began with going backwards, not forwards. It began not with, well, because my first, well, what do I need to do? Stop doing is what you need to first stop doing. And so where did I go? Where, Where did they take me? What did Josiah do when he started mentoring me and Amy and I lived a couple of blocks away. We would just go to his house and, and he and his wife walked us through sonship and that was eye-opening and terrifying at the same time. Is we started going backwards and say, okay, what, what, then, what then is the basics? What are the basics? What is the gospel that, that for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That because of God's infinite identity and glory, he gave his only son. And starting to unravel what, what that meant and what that took. Yes, I knew the theology of it, but I had a hard time getting to the heart, the real deep, like, emotive heart of what that is, of what God has done. And then what really undid me so that God could remake me so that we might become the righteousness of God. Brothers and sisters, in Christ, already and not yet, you are the righteousness of God. Not in and of yourself, because of he who sent him, who knew no sin, to be sin. That this this is who you are. And let me tell you, I have deeply struggled with that because I know myself well enough to know that in myself, that I'm a million miles from that. So how in the world can you call me that? One of my lowest points in life 
I was going through a deep, difficult time, doubting my value, doubting my love, doubting my identity. Uh, I was at the deepest point, and I, I reached out to a friend of mine that I had known for a long time. And I'm driving, and I can still visualize it right now. I'm driving this country road in Texas. And I call him up on my phone as I'm driving, and I am crying. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't do this anymore. I'm like, I'm such a wretch. I'm so broken. I'm never going to get better. Um, and my buddy Tim told me to pull over. Smart. I pulled over. He said, you know, do you have a Bible in your truck? And I, I had one with me. And he told me to open up to Romans 8.1. And I opened it up to Romans 8.1. And he said, I want you to read that to me out loud. And I looked at it with tears in my eyes. And I said, I literally cannot read these words. And he says, I, I want you to read them. And he, I said, I cannot read these words because I don't believe them. Because those words say, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That I had to go backwards and uphold like... I have no condemnation. I am loved infinitely. I am brought into this dance with this incredible king that loves me so deeply. And it's not about what I do for him. It's because he loves me. And it's so transformative for me. That, that a lot of us have been reading this book, Gentle and Lowly, and our church just went through it as well. And here's a, a, a quote from it. It was a quote from Goodwin that's quoted in the book that this high and holy Christ does not cringe at reaching out and touching dirty sinners and numbed sufferers. Such embrace is precisely what he loves to do. Really? He cannot bear to hold back. We naturally think of Jesus touching us the way a little boy reaches out to touch a slug for the first time, face screwed up, cautiously extending an arm, giving a yelp of disgust upon contact, and instantly withdrawing. We picture the risen Christ approaching us with a severe and sour disposition. I have. I have. And that is poor theology that's based upon the first step of who God is. That's not God's identity. And that's not how God behaves. But that's what I felt because my, my whole spectrum was backwards. What I did created whether I was valuable or not. And whether I was valuable or not decided whether God was going to be nice to me or not. And that determined what kind of a God he was. It's the opposite. Hallelujah. Yeah. That is the gospel that we need to keep preaching to ourselves first. To ourselves first. As we go, so goes the people with us. Jack Miller, that Josiah was talking about, this is one of his famous lines. He says, cheer up. You're a worse sinner than you ever dared imagine, and you are more loved than you ever dared hope. Amen. And then he would say, now, this is not worm theology. This is not like I am such a wretch. And he would say, for every one look at your sin, Look at Jesus 99 times because your identity now in Christ is you are the righteousness of God. And that was made true on this cross that says it was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And this is where we're going to go next is that temple as you all know, the curtain was torn in two because the curtain separated us that so we could not draw near to him or we would burn up. And we were separated. And so part of the Trinity was ripped out to come and draw us in. Listen to this hope out of the gentle and lowly as well. It says, because of that, in order for you to fall short of loving embrace 
into the heart of Christ, both now and into eternity, Christ himself would have to be pulled down out of heaven and put back into the grave. The only way your father is going to disown you is if he disowns his own son, because his own son has brought you home. So whenever you sin, this is a, one of the strangest concepts when I started wrapping my brain around it. Whenever you sin and you repent, when you're confessing to the Lord for forgiveness, you know what you're not asking for? You're not asking for mercy. You're asking for justice. Because the sin has already been paid for on the cross by the blood of Christ. And I, I gleaned that from other pastors that I did not make that up. You are saying, Jesus has paid for this. Thank you that you are a merciful God to send Jesus, and you are a just God to count his sacrifice for mine. And so what do we do? It's like whenever you do the marriage counseling, and, and you start working on the love between the husband and the wife, and you start working on on trusting each other and being drawn intimately with one another, there is an expression of that. And the expression is because of this high priest. So in Hebrews 4, that, that for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. He would not pass an English test with that sentence. He's not unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, and let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Remember that curtain has been torn in two. Draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so therefore what? Because of who Jesus is, he's a perfect high priest who was tempted and did not give in. And because he sacrificed himself and because the temple is torn in two, therefore, brothers and sisters... Therefore, and clearly the author of Hebrews was a Calvinist because he gives three points. <laughs> he gives three beautiful points of, of what this therefore means because he, he's, he's also a big fan of the Westminster Confession uh, and you know, or the larger catechism. What is the chief end of man? Well, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And forever has already started. And so our goal, our, our purpose as children of God is to enjoy him and then let that joy overflow out of us. As John Piper talked about, was that the God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So therefore, what does that mean? Go back to the well for satisfaction. Go back to the word. Go back to the truth. Go back to Jesus for satisfaction. And here, here's what it looks like. Okay, now I got to the application. The first is to draw near. He says, draw near to me with this true heart. He says, come in and be part of, of this family, this marriage that, that we have created. And so, for us to, to draw near with him, is, this is a point of boldness and intimacy. That this boldness, think about if, if you have kids, the boldness of drawing near that whenever uh, I heard a preacher at Redeemer New York, his name is Abraham Cho, just magnificent preacher. And he has a sermon on the Lord's Prayer. And I was, I was in his church during one of the, our mission trips to New York City. And he preached this, and I was just taken to the ground. He says that whenever, whenever a child comes to a loving, trustable father or mother, they come with just unfettered boldness. They come near to mom or dad, and they get on the lap. And he would even tell a story that his, his kid, and he would be distracted. His kid would just get right in his face and shake him, saying, Dad! We are being invited. Come near. It says, draw near. Come close to me. And this is, he's saying, be bold. Come near, but not, not just be bold, but also it's a, it's a 
It's a calling of intimacy. It's like, I love you. I know you. And I want you to know more about me. It's not the, the religious part of like, well, yes, go before God boldly. He says, no, go before God just naked and unashamed. This is who I am. So I believe our first calling as, not just as believers, yes, as believers, but as leaders, as ruling elders, as teaching elders, my very first point in my job description, draw near to God. Get in his lap. Be honest. Lay it out. Give him your tears. Think about how the psalmist would do it, and they would just lay it out there. And so many times I read the psalms, I feel like I'm like embarrassed for them. Like, oh, did, did he say that? But they're honest. So draw near in boldness and draw near in intimacy. And this next one is, is hold fast. And hold fast is, is it's to cling. It's the same it's the, it's the Greek version. It's the same as the old Genesis version of that you would cling to your wife. You would, you would leave and cleave. And so you would cling. And he's calling you, don't just come near to me, but hold me. I will hold you. And the beauty of this one right here, it's not just talking about us with him. That we're called to come together and cling we're called to hold fast that this is also a term, it's almost like gluing, it's, it's knitting these things together. That we are called to desperately, like right now, what are you desperately clinging to? And you can tell that by what, what makes you angry or what makes you really sad or what makes you really anxious. Do you want to know what you cling to? When you lose A, B, or C and I get really angry, that's what I'm clinging to. And so I confess it. So we're called, well, conf okay, yes, you're clinging to something besides Jesus. Welcome to the world. Take it to him and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I did it again today. I'm probably going to do it tomorrow. I don't want to. I need your mercies today and every day. I want to cling to him. So to, to draw near to him in boldness and intimacy to hold fast to him, to cling with intimacy. I bet you know the third point of this next one. It's not just to hold fast, but it's also to stir up, the, to come alongside each other, to walk in community as the bride of Christ. I want to show you a, a short video that really brought me to tears. Uh, I saw it yesterday, so I sent it to them real fast. Of what do you do when you're desperate? What do you do when your world is falling apart? So let's, let's just watch this real fast. the end. This guy who is just like, seriously? We, we can do that? How many of us are alone? How many of us behave as if we're alone? Now, I, I say that for us in this room, but also for people in your churches. Do you understand this is the norm now? 
This is how the people who are sitting in front of you on Sundays actually behave and feel. It is a horrifically desperate time. And our people need the gospel. And it's so much more apparent now because all the other facades have fallen off and there's nothing else to hold us up. And our people, including, man, pastors, we're the worst. How many of you have someone? There's been many times in my life I haven't. And there's that time I was telling you about with my buddy Tim where I was at the bottom and I find, I find like I have to. I have to, even though I'm embarrassed and I'm ashamed because he's going to think I'm a weak man, but I have to call him. And he gave me the words of life. And so I'm, I'm inviting us, the gospel is inviting us to, to come to him, but then to stir up. The, so I love this, this phrasing is, let us consider how to stir one another up. That word is like to ignite, is to set a flame. That how do we come alongside each other and stir each other up for encouragement, which literally means to give courage. How do we come alongside our brothers and sisters and say, I'm going to give you some courage because I have some extra today. Don't you need that? And, and I promise you, you are next to someone who does. And I promise you, you have people in front of you on Sundays who desperately need more courage. And it only comes by the Spirit through the sacrifice of Christ that he imputes that for us. So to stir us up, to, to ignite it, but it's also a relational, intimate endeavor to come alongside. It's scary to be vulnerable and to walk with someone but that's where life is found. It's what Josiah said earlier, that another word for faith is risk. It's risky to ask for help. It's risky to show your weaknesses. It's risky in this world. But the gospel hope and truth is that he has already paid that price, and he has called us not alone. Come, come. Draw near to me. Hold fast to me because it's, the Lord knows he's the one holding fast to us. And let's consider how to stir up one another in love. And all of those things, if Dr. T will come up as well, and I'll just read the passage and let him do the elements. That was all done for us on the cross. That was done for us at, at the table that when Jesus was with his disciples, that he invited them in and, and they drew near to him literally and emotionally and spiritually just with him. They held fast to one another where they, Peter didn't even want to let him go, but he had to go. And the, the supper stirs us up because it gives us strength and courage. It gives us life. And so as we come to the table, realize that because of who God is, this is what God has done. And because of what God has done, you are a child of God, adopted princes and princesses of the king. You are the righteousness of God. You are loved. You are the beloved. And because of that, we get to draw near and hold fast and stir up. And so... Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through the flesh. Let me read you what Jesus said at the Last Supper in Matthew. He said, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom.